Hi, this is Mrs. Mays, and we're going to do some more chemistry. Um, when we talk about the development of the atomic theory, we're basically trying to figure out what is matter made of? What is the universe made of? And how does it all work? Um, the ancient Greeks came up with some ideas in around 430 BC. A Greek philosopher named Democritus believed that matter consisted of tiny spheres um, that were indivisible. So he called them atomos. And he said they were moving through empty space, which he called the void. So then um, you can see where we get our idea of atoms. Atomos means indivisible. And then he would describe each different sphere as having different properties, and that's what made up all the different types of matter. Like a squishy sphere might be water, but a hard sphere might be iron, for instance. So that was Democritus's idea, and that's what the Greeks taught for a long time. But then came Aristotle, and Aristotle's idea was that um, all of the elements on Earth are made from a combination of only four things, water, fire, wind, and Earth. And so what makes copper or any other substance unique would be the way these four elements are combined, its unique blend of these four elements. So this idea prevailed for quite a long time actually, even through the alchemists which worked um, into basically the Renaissance time practically. So um, alchemists were not really doing true chemistry because they weren't measuring their results and keeping track of things in notebooks, but they gained a lot of knowledge and insights about matter and the world around them. and and they were able to describe certain elements and compounds that were identified by alchemists. So, you know, not true scientists, but they certainly achieved a lot in extending our knowledge about the world around us. A lot of this came about through the idea of turning elements into gold. You see, an alchemist thought maybe if I had some tin and I added just the right amount of earth, say, to it, or, or fire, or water, then I could transmute my tin into gold. That was the goal, because if you had more gold, you'd be rich, right? And so we could take more useless things and make something precious. Another great advancement of the alchemists was to have medical cures come about. Now, not all of the cures were actually cures. Sometimes they prescribed mercury to extend somebody's life, and now we know, well, mercury actually kind of kills you, so don't take it for medicine. It's not good for you. But at least the alchemists made some great strides for us along the way. Finally comes John Dalton. This wasn't until the early 1800s in England that John Dalton proposed um, some ideas about atoms. He was able to observe the physical world and make observations about matter, and through those observations draw some conclusions about atoms themselves. So here's what his notebook looked like. This is an excerpt from his 1808 book where he describes a new system of chemical philosophy and we want to look at the four basic ideas in his, um, in his book. So here's the first one. All matter is composed of atoms which are indivisible that an atom would be the smallest part of matter that you could possibly have. And each compound consists of a set ratio of atoms, like water would always be two hydrogens for every one oxygen, and carbon dioxide has one carbon for every two oxygens every single time, that that's how we make compounds. John Dalton also said that atoms of the same element will be identical. So every time you find the smallest bit of carbon that you can have, it's going to look exactly the same as the other carbons that we find. But if you had two different elements, then their atoms, their tiniest bits, they would be different because they're not the same element. So far, so good, right? And then finally, this was a critical piece. Atoms are not changed. They're not created. And they're not destroyed in a reaction. We just rearrange the atoms to get new and different things. So here's an example of hydrochloric acid 
breaking down and decomposing into hydrogen molecules and chlorine molecules. So we have the same atoms present, we've just changed the way they're bonded. So a lot of the parts of Dalton's atomic theory are still true for chemistry today. But I want to show you one of the biggest problems with Dalton's theory. So here's um, a hydrogen atom, and I'm going to shoot some white light at it, and we're going to watch and see what happens as the particles bombard the atom. So we're building up in this bottom corner over here the spectrum of this, and I'm going to speed up my spectrometer, I'm going to speed up my photons, and we're going to build the spectrum a little bit faster here. So let's let this run for a little bit and talk about what we see. So one of the features in this real hydrogen atom that we see is that certain photons bounce back towards us. Remember uh, Rutherford's experiment? Right, so we know sometimes the particles don't pass straight on through. And when they are deflected, that means some energy gets transferred. A lot of particles in the UV are being deflected and the energy is being transferred. And then here's some other pieces, but only certain frequencies are actually causing a change. And that comes back to um, the photoelectric effect. Remember Max Planck said there are certain energies which will emit the electrons, but not all of them. This is what helped us to describe the photon as a particle instead of as a wave. Well, only certain energies will get things moving in that atom. Let's see what Dalton's model predicts, because this is what really happens. Let's compare that to Dalton's theory and see if his prediction makes sense. You see, Dalton pictured atoms as being indivisible. That means you can't break them down into any smaller bits. So let me slow this down and you can see the collisions taking place. It looks like what would happen if billiard balls collided, right? So they sometimes call this a billiard ball model because all of the particles that hit the atom bounce away um, and they get deflected at angles depending on where exactly along the surface of the atom they strike. So Compare the spectrometer that we show now to the spectrometer that we just observed. Right? There's no bands, no colors, nothing um, it has changed based on the collisions. And so that's kind of a problem. You see, if a theory does not match with reality, then we don't get to discard reality. We have to discard the theory and modify it and come up with something better. Dalton's theory did not match reality, but there were some important aspects of Dalton's theory that we want to be sure to address. For example, the law of conservation of mass. The law of conservation of mass says that the total mass of substances that are present at the end of a chemical process is exactly the same as the mass of substances present before the process took place. This law is still one of the guiding principles of all of science, not just chemistry but also physics as well, and biology too. Um, everything in the universe that there will be already exists. And he wasn't able to prove it until a man in France, Antoine Lavoisier, was able to get sophisticated enough equipment to capture and measure all of the gases that were released when mercury oxide decomposed. And then he had some empirical evidence that if you add these two masses together, they are equal to the mass that we started with. And Antoine Lavoisier did this with lots of different types of substances, was able to show that the Dalton was right about this. So even though he didn't quite get the model of the atom right, he was right about enough things to get us started in the right direction.